Shalom, y'all. We're Marty and Deborah Cohen, and we're just a couple of Jewish seniors who live in Marietta, which is like Atlanta, Georgia. And Passover, which is what we're starting out tonight, is the number one celebrated Jewish holiday, and it's been that way for over 3,000 years, all right? Now, tonight, the first night, it's celebrated more than any other, all right? In fact, this tonight is celebrated by the most ultra-Orthodox religious Jewish people and the most secular, almost not even Jewish really Jewish people, all right? And it's also celebrated by a lot of non-Jewish people because, look, Passover is the remembrance and the prelude to our freedom, all right? It's called the Holiday of Freedom, all right? And tonight, we're not hosting a full Seder, all right? Um, Tonight, we're only going to focus on the two main elements that are eaten and consumed, rather, at the Seder. And that is matzah, which is unleavened bread, and wine. Or, you know, let me just tell you that the, the, the prayer is, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. So grape juice will do, all right? So what I'd like y'all to do now is grab your matzah and your preferred fruit of the vine and get ready, and we'll be right back. So we can get started. I think we're back. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't easy. <laughs> For some reason, Ecam is sending everything to twitch.tv yeah. slash Deborah yeah. Cohen Co and, Music. And it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm sorry, folks, but let's carry on. Yeah, we're All right, so we want to thank... Um, Rabbi Ellen Bernstein for letting us use her Haggadah called The Promise of the Land. And this is a very unique situation because um, part of the promises of God, yeah. when he took us out of Egypt, well, we're going to read about him. And you're going to yeah. see that two of the things that God promised are missing in from rabbinic Judaism, right. and Rabbi Ellen Bernstein discovered this apparently and made her own Haggadah, which we're going to share excerpts from her Haggadah. If you want to get it yourself, it's called The Promise of the Land, a Passover Haggadah by Rabbi Ellen Bernstein. I know that uh, she sells it on Amazon, so you can look there. And uh, we're going to focus on the matzah and the wine. So thank you for being here. If you found us, you get a gold star because it took it us. It wasn't a, easy. It took us a while to find us too. Right. right. <laughs> so, so let's. We, we're there. Okay. So are we ready to screen share? I think let's do it, baby. Uh, let's oh, get started. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try to make this bigger so we can. Read it better. Thank you. And uh, you can listen to us share the story. <laughs> and we'll kind of read it together. You know, we'll, we'll take turns reading. Yes. So I'll start out. Okay. <laughs> All right. The symbolic foods of the Seder, matzah, symbolizing affliction and liberation. Making matzah is a great way to connect with the elemental aspects of the holiday. While it's complicated to make matzah at home, since it's difficult to ensure that the matzah is kosher for Passover, you may find opportunities to make matzah in a synagogue kitchen, or you can purchase handmade round shmura matzah, matzah that is watched from harvesting until it's packaged from specialty stores or online, or you can ask your grocer to order it. Each handmade matzah with its burnt edges and wavy texture adds character to the Seder table. Of course, you can also purchase regular matzah at the grocery store. Ah, so did you did you want to show them your matzah from Israel? Where is it? It's right there. On the oh, right here. Yeah, let's do that. Um, let me get it opened. Okay. And... Well, let me read while you're trying to open the box. Wait. Okay. Go ahead. Read about the wine. Okay. Try to be quiet opening the box. Okay. Doing the best I can. All it's, right. I know you are. It's a loud process. Okay. The promise of land in the Haggadah. What does all this have to do with our Haggadah, the story of Passover? When the instructions for what would become the Seder were written, written down in the 2nd century CE, the rabbi stipulated that along with drinking four cups of wine 
asking three questions. Originally, there were three, not four. Discussing Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, and reciting Psalms and Blessings, we were charged to read one biblical passage in its entirety. That passage encapsulates the Jewish story and can be summed up like this. My father was a, a wandering Aramean. We went down to Egypt and multiplied there. The Egyptians imposed harsh labor on us and oppressed us. We cried out to God and God heard our voice. God led us out of Egypt with signs and wonders. And God gave us a land. And now we bring the first fruit to the land which you, God, have given to us, according to Deuteronomy 26, 5, 10. And I just want to make mention for those listening on the podcast, there are two sentences here that are in bold, which apparently are not in most Haggadahs today, namely, and God gave us a land. Can you be quiet? I, I cannot. And now we bring the first fruits of the land which you, God, <clears throat> have given to us. But by the time the actual Haggadah was composed several centuries later, the last two verses, the bold verses I mentioned previously, had been dropped. What? What is the nature of these two verses, and why were they dropped from the Haggadah? The the verses again are, And God gave us a land. And the second verse is, Now we bring the first fruit to the land which you, God, have given to us. So, number one, and God gave us a land. From Deuteronomy 26, 9, the days of slavery, oppression, and wandering were over. Now we would have a land to inhabit and care for, a land in which to grow our food and pasture our animals, build our shelters, and live our lives. Land meant freedom. There is nothing more valuable than land. And number two, and now we bring the first fruits of the land which you, God, have given to us, which you can find in Deuteronomy 26.10. Each spring, when the fruits were finally ripe on the vine, we would set aside the first, most perfect ones for God. That which was most precious to us, we would bring to God as an expression of our gratitude for the land and our recognition that God, not us, is the owner of of all land and everything in it. Did you hear that? (laughs) In the words of the psalmist, the earth is Adonai's and all of its fullness. See Psalm 24, verse 1. In returning the fruits to God, we were participating in the eternal round of giving and receiving. And so Marty's going to show us something here. Here is the Shura Matzah that I got from Israel. All right. And you can see... It's kind of wavy, and the edges are burned, and and uh, it, it's it's you know it talks about how difficult it is to make. It's not so much, but in a way it is. All right, I mean, there's only two ingredients. All right, it, it's wheat and water. Um, but from the moment that the first drop of water hits the wheat, you you hit the stop clock, stopwatch. All right, and so then you've got to mix it up knead it, roll it out, perforate it, put it in the oven, close the door, let it bake until it's done, take it out of the oven, and stop the watch. And as long as you've done the whole process in 18 minutes, it's kosher for Passover. If not, it's not kosher for Passover, Mm. you know. Okay. And so people say, what's the difference in kosher for Passover matzah and not kosher for Passover? About two dollars, three dollars a box. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the screen share, uh, Marty. Can yeah, you, can the you ecological this? message of the Haggadah has pretty much been lost. All right, while the rabbis didn't explain why they deleted these two verses from the Haggadah, we can infer a possibility. The very first instruction for the Seder, including the two verses, were probably written a generation or two after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. That's 70 of the Common Era, all right? When, even though many Jews had scattered to other lands, there was still a sizable Jewish population there in Israel. These two verses assume the Israelites were living in the land of Israel and offering the fruits of that land in the Temple in Jerusalem. 
But by the end of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion in 135, the Common Era, the, the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, a lot more Jews were living in exile and they had no land on which they belonged. And by the third century, these verses may have been eliminated, omitted because the reality of life in the exile was so far from the vision of what the Jews thought they had been promised, mm. a land where they could dwell in peace and safety. Wow. Yet, without these two verses, it's easy to forget why God chose to free us from slavery in the first place. God led us out of Egypt because God had promised us a land so that we could live as a free people. But we would only inherit the land if we honored our covenantal relationship by living good, wholesome, righteous lives. If we behaved unethically or irresponsibly toward each other, toward the land, or toward God, we would lose that land promise. Ah, so is that why we're struggling today? Here we with are. The land? Here we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even people living in the land today don't have it so easy. Yeah. So. All go, right. Go ahead, read. Without these two verses, it's also easy to conceive of God as a triumphal deity and the Israelites as the passive recipients of God's largesse. These two verses portray God as a partner in a dynamic reciprocal relationship with a people who are actors in their own destiny. I realize that by retrieving these two verses and returning them back to the central Jewish narrative, the Passover Haggadah could convey a profound ecological message. I offer them to you here with the hope that this Seder can remind us of our deep ecological heritage, inspire us to rejoice in the fullness of the earth, and lead us to live lives that honor Hamakom, the one whose presence fills every place. Before we go on, let me just talk about that one word, that name, Hamakom. It means the place, all right? And when I learned that Hamakom was the name of God, all right, it really struck me that God has implanted his Shekinah, his, his Holy Spirit, if you would, within each one of us. And no matter where we are, that means that God's presence is there. That is the place because it's his place. And so that's up to us to live according to, as the Haggadah said, live honorable, righteous lives. Yes. So I have to give a shout out to Rabbi Ellen Bernstein yeah. for putting these two scriptural verses back into the Haggadah where they belong. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Kudos, kudos, kudos. Still, it can be hard for some to imagine that something so lowly, so inconspicuous and ordinary as land or soil, could have much value. Many people associate land and soil with dirt, something to rid ourselves of, never recognizing it as the ground of our being. On the other hand, many associate the word land in a Jewish context with the land of Israel only and are unable to recognize the land more universally and any land or as earth. As physicists have taught us, if you focus on a particle, it's impossible to see the wave. And that's probably true. And you know, I mean, I lived in Israel for six years, but God's brought me to live in Marietta, Georgia. And so now this is Hamakom. Yes. So and, it's, and, and I've got to live here as righteous as Israelites lived in Israel. Right. So it's still land. It's that's still right. the earth. And that's right. So wherever you are, whether you're in, in Israel or if you're in Texas or if you're in, you know, Timbuktu, it's still Hamakom. It's still ah. the land, Haaretz, that God has brought you to Lazman Hase for such a time as this. Wow. So enjoy it and live in it righteously. Okay. So, now, All right. the okay. promise of the land in the Torah. Curious about land's place in the Bible, I ran a quick word search and was surprised to find that the word land itself, actually two words, Adama and Aretz, now get this, appears more than 2,500 times. Perhaps the ubiquity of land in our text prevents us from actually seeing it in the same way that we easily lose sight of the ground or land upon which we walk. With more study, I began to understand the whole Torah, starting with the Garden of Eden as the story of a people and a land. In the beginning, we Israelites were landless. Then, 
God made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and after him to Jacob and all the subsequent generations that we would inherit a land that we could call home. En route to the promised land, we would endure 400 years in Egypt where Pharaoh owned and exploited the land and everyone in it. For Pharaoh, land had no inherent value. It was a commodity. Utilizing slave labor, Pharaoh increased the land's agricultural output, amassing more and more wealth for the royal coffers. Living so long in Pharaoh's exploitive economy, we would come to forget the meaning of land. If God were to give us a land, we would need to recognize the land's incomparable value. God took us to the wilderness for 40 years to teach us that land, the earth, is not a thing. It's not ours to acquire, and it's not guaranteed. Land, people, and God are imperceptibly bound in a three-way covenant relationship, knit together as echad, as one. What is the promise of the land? The promise of the land refers to the primary blessing that God gives all the ancestors in the Bible, Eretz, or land. That the Hebrew word Eretz means not just land, but also earth, conveys a profound ecological sense. The land or earth is the home of the swimming creatures, the flying creatures, the walking, climbing, crawling, hopping, and sprinting creatures, <laughs> and us. The <laughs> land, the earth, is our habitat, and we are its inhabitants. Land or earth is the most precious blessing a people can receive. It is the source of sustenance. It is the promise of life, the promise of freedom. Unfortunately, many people regard land as lifeless and inert. Real estate to be bought and sold or territory to be acquired and owned. And many Jews conflate land with the land of Israel only. If people view land this way, the whole subject of land invariably turns economic or political. And the deeper ecological meaning of the land is lost. When we approach the Seder with a broader appreciation of land, its spiritual, aesthetic, and ecological value, the Haggadah reveals its deep environmental meaning. So who's this Haggadah for exactly? Well, this Haggadah is intended for those who are curious and want to dig deep. <clears throat> it, is, it understands the Passover story in universal and mythic terms. It is written for people with little or no background in Judaism, as well as those with strong backgrounds, be they religious, spiritual, or secular. It aspires to reconnect participants to the beauty of the holiday and the world while exploring essential questions about who we are and where we came from. Talking about God, you see, God is central character in the Passover story. So it can be worthwhile to consider how to help guests who may be uncomfortable with God, God language, feel at home in the Seder. Judaism offers many understandings and metaphors for God. God is known <laughs> as the breath of life, the Ruach Elohim, the rock, the eagle, the nursing mother the bringer of rain. God's Hebrew name, spelled yod Hey vav Hey, can be translated as one who causes being. God is the force, the mystery of the universe beyond our control. In ecological terms, God is the oneness that connects all things. The Jewish people are called Israel, or Yisrael, which means one who wrestles with God. To be Jewish means to wrestle with the meaning of God, not necessarily to believe in God. This Haggadah integrates these understandings and invites readers to consider God as the ancient rabbis often did, as Hamakom or the place, the one that connects and sustains all places and creatures that inhabit them. <sighs> now, it's time for... The Kaddish. The first two steps of the Seder, HaKadosh and Ukutz, create a doorway through which 
We leave behind the busy outer world and enter a more reflective inner world. Time and space circumscribe our lives. To sanctify time, we recite the Kiddush. To prepare our bodies and our physical space, we wash our hands. Wine inaugurates this holy day as it does all Jewish festivals. It elevates our meal, turning the act of eating into a sacred and joyous occasion. We drink wine to make the time holy. As free people, our time is our own, and we can spend it as we wish. Slaves were deprived of this freedom. On Passover, we drink four cups of wine to soften our edges and dissolve any blocks to our happiness and our freedom. The first cup signifies God's bringing us out of Egypt. All right? And so we hold our cups in our right hand, even if you're left-handed like my wife is, <laughs> and we pray this blessing. Now, it's, before we actually get to the blessing, there's a reading from Deuter, uh, from Genesis 1, um, 31. 31 through 2, 5. There was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. The heavens and the earth and all their inhabitants were complete. God completed by the seventh day all the work that God had done. And God rest ceased on the seventh day from all the work that God had done. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God ceased from all the work that God created to make. And now the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pri And Bless are you, eternal our God, force of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. L'chaim, which means to life and to love, because it's us. And now, you're required to have at least three sips of wine. The ancient rabbis suggested that the four cups of wine correspond to the four-part process of becoming free. <clears throat> we read in Exodus 6, 6 and 7, First, I will bring you, that's one, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you, that's two, from being slaves to them. I will redeem you, that's three, with an outstretched arm, and I will take you, that's four, as my people, and I will be your God. So, there you go. In many Jewish homes, whenever the wine glass is lifted at the Seder, the matzah is covered so it won't feel dejected. Since it's not receiving a blessing. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. That's kind of sweet, but, you know, that's fun. Okay. All right. And now, the yakits, all right? Now we take, <coughs> whoops. You start the Seder always with <coughs> three pieces of matzah. Can they see me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you never take the first or the bot take the top or the bottom. You always take the middle piece, all right? And you break it in half, which this is going to be a little messy, but you break it in half. There you go. All right. <clears throat> now, matzah is a sem central symbol of Passover. Passover, is, it's even called Hag HaMatzah, the holiday of matzah. Matzah is the simplest of all food. It's wheat and water, humble pie. It's parched dry, and unassuming like the desert. Thank you. When we consider matzah relative to bread, one of the meanings becomes clear. Bread is the puffed-up version of wheat. Aha! Far removed from the flour and the earth from which it comes. In the context of Passover, bread symbolizes the additives and excesses that weigh us down and enslave us. Matzah reminds us of what bread would be like, would, would, would like us to forget. Passover is the path back to basics. The earth, the wheat, the water, and our essential selves. Passover teaches that freedom comes when we rid ourselves of the burden of too much. For now we simply admire the matzah and reflect on it, the root food of our peoplehood. The broken matzah is symbolic of our own brokenness and the brokenness of the world. Some of us have broken with the past. 
We may have lost a sense of history and a connection to our ancestors. Others may feel broken or detached from our earthly, earthy home. We may have lost touch with the natural world and all it gives us freely each day. The whole matzah represents wholeness and freedom. It's the food of liberation that the Israelites ate as they hurried out of Egypt. It helps us to retrieve lost parts of ourselves so that we may become whole again. Now, <laughs> all right. At this point, we take these this broken matzah and you take both halves and you put it in, uh, you wrap it in linen and you hide it away someplace, all right? And so that at the end of the Seder, the children go and search for this. And, and what this is called at that point is Afikoman. We'll talk about that at the end, all right? But it's a very, very important part of the Seder. And you can't end the Seder without this. So we'll see more later. Okay. Matzah is the most elemental food, wheat and water. Eating matzah leads us back to the earth, to our essential selves. We depend on other creatures, both animal and vegetable. To live, we must take from the natural world. When we do this with reverence, it is a blessing. When we do it thoughtlessly or greedily, it's a desecration. As you eat the matzah, taste it for as if it's for the first time. Notice the matzah's texture, its crunchiness, its lightness, its burnt edges. <laughs> Remember where the matzah came from. Berries of wheat sown in the ground, watered by the rains, and nurtured by the sun. All right. All right. So have a piece of matzah. So take a piece of matzah, not from the two pieces we just broke. So this has to come from the top or the bottom piece of matzah, all right? So, and the blessing is, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitsat Shanu, Mitzvotah Vitzivanu Le'achlit Matzah, Blessed are you, eternal our God, force of the universe, who makes us holy through your mitzvah of, uh, your mitzvah by commanding us to eat matzah. Eat matzah. So, have a nosh. Matzah. And notice its crunchiness. Yep. <laughs> and its lightness. Its burnt edges. Mm hmm. Mm. All that jazz. I like matzah. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. But it's the only thing we, we're, we're expected to eat it for seven days. And it has a rather binding effect. So. Well, that could be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay to wash it down with some wine? Yes, that's that's. Oh. You bet you it is. <laughs> fine, fine. All right. In every generation, each of us is obligated to see ourselves as if we personally went out of Egypt, as it says. You shall tell your children on that day. It's because of this that God did for me when I went out from Egypt. Not only were our ancestors redeemed by the Holy One, blessed be He, but we too were redeemed with them. As it says, God took us out from there to bring us out and to give us the land God swore to our ancestors. Hallelujah. So cover the matzah and raise, but don't drink the second cup as That's a that. toast to God and recite together. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech olam borei pri Amen. Therefore we must thank Sing hallelujah, praise, exalt, elevate, beautify, bless, lift up and loud the one who worked all these wonders for our ancestors and us. God brought us from slavery to freedom, from grief to happiness, from darkness to light, from slavery to redemption. Let's sing to the one a new song. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Hallel, praising. Hallel is Judaism's deepest gratitude practice, all right? Um, reciting more psalms may seem repetitive, but the more we practice gratitude, the more grateful and joyous we'll become. Now, Hallel, there are several words in Hebrew for giving thanks, but the one that's used more than all of the rest of them combined is Hallel. 
And we add the U on the end because Anachnu means we. So when we say hallelujah, we're saying we praise Yah, God. Yes, I had some lady asking, uh, what does Hallel mean? It means praising. Right, yeah. right, Hallel. Hallel, Lu, like you said. Yeah, ooh. Let yeah. us praise. Let us praise. And who are we going to yeah. praise? Yah. Yeah. Yeah. And Yah is the first syllable of yod heh vav heh That holy name is so holy that it's never pronounced. Only the high priest in the days of the temple, only on Yom Kippur, went inside the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he pronounced that name twice, and that was the only time it was ever said in the course of a year. So if you got people that are, are saying, you know, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah this, Jehovah that, that's not God's name. No. Right? That's not God's name. That's uh, a translation. It's, it's, we, we don't yeah. translate God's no, name. No. no. We, we, Learn the name. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about it. Consider in praising God, what are we grateful for? What part of your body or, or what body function or what kind of trees or plants or people what animals, insects, or places, waterway, or weather, or music, what books, or what aspect of Judaism, what right here in this moment are you grateful for? I'm most grateful for my bride <laughs> and for the opportunity to share this special Pesach prelude with people all over the world. Yeah, same here, yeah, dear. Yeah. So we're going to sing a verse that associates slavery with a narrow place the Metzar, and God with a sense of spaciousness. I like that. So, <laughs> all right, so let me go to full screen because I want to share something about the Metzar. This is a, from um, Rabbi Danny Uppen, and oh. uh, it's a little bit of a... A, a drosh. Drosh? A okay. drosh. Okay, thank you. So this Min Remetzar that we're going to sing together is... From Psalm 118, a poetic expression of personal redemption that draws heavily from motifs present in the Exodus narrative. As a description of the poet's own personal exodus from Egypt, it is an ode to God for deliverance from travails. The psalm's suffering is expressed in a metaphor that depicts him trapped in a narrow place. From the Metzar, I call to Yah. Yeah, answered me in a wide open place. The narrow place, Metzar, sounds like the Hebrew name for Egypt, Mitzrayim. Yeah. Both biblically and in the Haggadah, the oppression in, in Egypt is described with the same spatial metaphor employed in Psalm 118 as a confinement in a narrow place. So as we recount the Haggadah and we cried out to God and God heard our voice, let us be thankful for coming out of Lachatz. Oh, man. Lachatz is a place of narrowness and constriction, which is mentioned in Deuteronomy 26, verse 7. May I hand you your guitar? Yes, please. Okay. This is why I'm sitting behind Deborah. <laughs> so <laughs> A very I, good reason. <laughs> yes, so you can see the words there on the screen if you're watching live or in the archives. If you're not and you're listening to this on a podcast, then the words that are min chemetzar karatiya anani vamerkavya. So we're going to sing this together. And this is a song from Deborah Sachs Mintz. Mi Let's try that again. And really think about what you're grateful for. Mm 
חמצר קרדיה ענני במרכביה Now the second part goes Adonai li loira Yase, yase hi adam Adonai li loira Oma, yase hi adam Let's do the second part again Adonai li loira Gratitude Gratitude I called upon the Lord. I was answered with expansiveness. God answered me from the expanse. God is on my side. I have no fear. What can humanity do to me? Huh. Lee. Yes. Nothing. So the second song we're going to sing is O Z V Z Mora. Yeah. Ah. This one I know. What does God what does God is my song mean to you? This psalm understands God in terms of kindness, spaciousness, help, strength, song, freedom, and goodness. Oh, yes. And that, read that in English. <laughs> my strength balanced with the song of God will be my mm. salvation. That's according to Psalm 118.14 and also Exodus 15.2. You know, if God puts the same verse in his Torah twice, there's a reason to pay attention. Uh, all right, so listen first and then you can join me. This is a melody from Shefa Gold. Ovi Ozi Vezimwadia Vahiri Lishua Ozi Vezimwadia
Well, retrieving the hidden matzah is like recovering a hidden part of ourselves. So at this point in the Seder, matzah symbolizes our liberation. Eating it can help us make us whole again. So it's fitting that the last food we partake of in the Seder is matzah. We began the meal with matzah, and we end the meal with matzah. Eating matzah, we admire again the wheat and the earth from which it comes. We leave the Seder with a hint of the earth in our mouths. Ah, and so, so now... Now let's have another nibble. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here, that's your half. Okay. And you've got the rest of the night to eat it. You don't have to eat it all right now. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Amen. Oh yeah. Now as we talk about this song Dayenu um, I want you to think about three praises that you can say that would be enough to a spouse, a friend, or if you're single, even even to God, that you want to be thankful for. So do you want to explain the Yeah, number? let me talk to you about this. All right, there's Passover, a traditional Seder in an Orthodox home is about a four or five hour meal, all right? <clears throat> and it only starts after the sun goes down. So, you know, you're going to eat until midnight or so. <laughs> and you're drinking four cups of wine, and children from about the age of six or seven, once they start going to Hebrew school, once they start learning Hebrew at all and studying their Torah portion, they're expected to drink the wine with you, all right? So um, at this point, they've had three cups of wine, and now they got they got to clean their plate, and then they got to go look for the afikoman. And somebody returns the afikoman. They find it, they bring it in, and they get money back for it. And then we sing another song or two or six. All right. And Dayenu is the most popular and well loved, well known song at all. And it means it would have been enough. All right. Mm. And and so. I don't know if we have the English translations here, do we? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Well, um, basically, the, the verses, there there's something like 86 verses. So you don't sing, you'll sing three or four of them usually. But basically, you say, if God had brought us out of Egypt, but had not let us survive the wilderness, it would have been enough. If God had let us survive the wilderness, but had not opened the Red Sea, it would have been enough. If God had opened the Red Sea, but had not brought us to the Promised Land, it would have been enough. If God had brought us to the Promised Land, but had not given us the Torah, it would have been enough. Okay, so, so like so that. Let's, because we don't have the words. <laughs> so we're just going to sing. The, the, uh, this is a chorus. You, you will sing the, the verse, because yeah. you know the Hebrew I, better. Yeah. And we will all sing. Die, the, die, the, a new, die, 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 die. Die, die, a new, die, a new, die, a new, die, a new, die. Now, wait. Oh, okay. I want you to be thinking about while you're singing three things that you're grateful for, and you can share them in the chat, or we'll three things that you're grateful for. Okay. Okay. Die, die, a new, die, die, a new, die, die, a new, die, a new, die, a new, die. Die, 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 anew, die, die, anew, die, die, anew, die, die, anew, die, 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 It would have been enough, enough just to take us out of Egypt, but we know, spiritually speaking, every day we're being transformed. That's right. But Elohim. That's right. We're being taken out of Egypt. 
moment by moment. It would have been there. enough if he just rescued us from Texas. <laughs> 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 Nice. Oh, sorry. Come if you're on. listening from Texas, I, I don't mean to offend you. That's you know, right. everybody's got their thing, right? That's right? Okay. We're glad you're here. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. We might come back and visit someday. You never but, know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to our screen share. <sighs> All right. Nitsa means parting. We close with a ritual pronouncement next year in Jerusalem. In a wordplay on Jerusalem, some rabbis suggested that Yeru refers to awe, while Shalem, like Shalom, refers to wholeness and peace. We pray that Jerusalem, the spiritual center for three great traditions, experience the peace that its name promises. We pray that all people everywhere stand in awe of the heavens and the earth and know the peace that comes from living lives of wonder. In the year to come, let us dedicate ourselves to making our cities, wholesome cities, cities of peace. And let us all say, L'Shana Behaba B'Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, next year in awe and in peace. Amen and amen. Hashem, which means with the help of God. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. So we're going to sing Hatikva, and if you don't know the melody, you can just hum along. <laughs> it, well, actually, I love what this lady that we see on TV says. If you don't know the words, sing louder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay, and if you don't know the Hebrew, that's all right. anima. <laughs> Nefesh Yehudi Omiya Ufate Mislach Kadima Ayin Zion Sophia Olam Tikvate Nu As long as within our hearts the Jewish soul sings, as long as forward to the east to Zion looks the eye, our hope is not yet lost. It is actually 3,000 years to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and the land of Jerusalem. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> it's been wonderful being with you folks tonight. And uh, we hope that you'll share this link that we're going to send you here in a minute <laughs> with your friends, your family, and people that need to share, need to understand the true meaning of Passover. It's the holiday of our freedom. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for our technical difficulties. It is what it is. You know? <laughs> yeah, I just never know. But we just wanted to share Pesach a little little taste of Pesach, and I hope that you have some place to experience a full table Seder. Uh, We're going tomorrow night. Yeah, and if you don't, you know, what? You, you, I'm sorry. You, well, actually, I'm sure you can find second night Seders online. Yeah, yeah, they, you might even be able to find one on Zoom. Yeah. Like it, some, some yeah. synagogue groups are... are Unrelated synagogues are having a Seder online, so you Tomorrow can experience. Night. Right. But we hope that you've enjoyed this, and um, I wish, you know, like next year, I hope we can do this on Zoom so we can actually see everybody. That would be good. Uh, but I, I just thank you for being here, and I hope that you have a wonderful Passover experience. And remember, every day, every day, God gives us an awakening 
within ourselves individually and collectively as a community From that to intrigue. come out of its mitzayim. The narrow place. Yes, because we all need improvement and it, improvement comes to us in different ways, but especially be thinking about it during this Passover. What is the chametz that you want to get rid of in your life? Maybe there's somebody that you need to forgive. Maybe just doing kind acts during this feast. And what is it for? Seven days? Yeah. Do something Seven special nights. every right. day. Something kind. Right. To a little mitzvah. Amen. So thank you so much. Chag Pesach Sameach. Amen. Chag Pesach Kasher Sameach. And next year in Jerusalem. The men. The men. The men.